Hey everyone, today we are going to jump right back in where we jumped out just a few days ago and talk a little bit more about this intriguing relationship between this beast in the book of the Revelation and the great red dragon or the great fiery dragon. Uh, last video uh, we discussed a little bit about the three different signs in the book of the Revelation and kind of you know, trying to keep everything in context. Uh, and so we, we looked at this woman in Revelation 12, uh, verse 1, which is the first sign. So let me just read this here for a second quick, just to briefly review. Um, Revelation 12, I don't have the uh, scriptures on the screen this time, so I'm going to just read it right out of my Bible. Uh, it says, And there appeared a great wonder or sign in heaven, uh, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. And I had mentioned before that this woman symbolizes the seven churches and how they began. And uh, we read on here in verse 2, it says, And she being with child cried, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. And so we know that at some point here, the presence of Moses' law, the presence of the spirit of Moses' law has crept back into the churches, uh, from what John wrote in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, we know that's the case. The churches became very legalistic, uh, very worldly oriented. Uh, they began valuing what the world values and adopted the, basically the world's view of success as their own. And so, uh, you know, much like today. And, um, and so this... Uh, being with child, cry, uh, uh, she cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. This is, again, a reference back all the way to Genesis, where uh, Eve was told that uh, because they had partaken of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, uh, which is a type of the law of Moses, um, that as a result, she was going to bring forth children in sorrow. So the presence of that, the, the curse of that law, uh, and the presence of Moses' law is not a blessing, it's a curse. It really is. Uh, because the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is rooted and grounded in death. And as I had shared before, and we've preached over the years many, many times on this, hundreds of times on this, that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was not in the Garden of Eden. It was separate from the Garden. There was nothing that uh, Adam or Eve could have partaken of in the Garden to separate them from the garden. That's ridiculous. You can't partake of something that is in union and have it separate you or at least give the illusion of separation. That's impossible. So we'll, and we'll get into this a little bit more depth uh, as we have over the years. I'd like to present the content of that on video at some point uh, so you can see it for yourself. And you're going to look at the scriptures just like I did when it first jumped out at me and think, how in the world did I miss this? I mean, we know the story about Adam and Eve, at least we think we do, like the back of our hands, and then you just read it again, and I point out a few things here, and it pops, and it's like, wow, uh, what else is in there that we've missed? So um, so this uh, being with child and crying and travailing in birth, she's pained to be delivered, um, this is the proof that there is, once again, the presence of Moses' law, but it's also good news because it's also the proof that there is a birthing and a coming forth of a people out of her. And uh, we're going to be getting uh, into that more also. And that she is the first sign. And I think I might have mentioned it on the last video too about how, I don't think I ever finished my point though. Uh, sometimes I follow the rabbit trail and I'll, I'll, I will tell you when I see the bunny tail hopping and I will follow that trail and sometimes I don't ever come back. And I think this was the case last time, but you know, uh, Apostle Paul, um, in the uh, book of Acts, it says that he uh, passed through the upper regions and came to Ephesus, and he found certain of John's disciples who didn't even know there was such a thing as the baptism of the Holy Ghost. They had only been water dumped. And so um, Paul asked them had they received the Spirit. And uh, when they said that they hadn't heard, he laid his hands on uh, them and the spirit filled them they began speaking with other tongues and prophesying and it says in the book of Acts chapter 19 
that the number of men was 12, or about 12. Um, this happens in Ephesus. Isn't it interesting that the first church in the book of the Revelation mentioned is Ephesus? We find out that from there, Apostle Paul goes to the school of Tyrannus, and for the space of two years, he argues and disputes every day out of the scriptures. Can you imagine it? Two whole years, every single day, arguing and disputing out of the scriptures of how Jesus is the Christ. And it said God granted that some amazing supernatural signs and wonders and healings and miracles and deliverances took place. And it says so that all of Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus. All of Asia. So, again, isn't it interesting that these seven churches are all in Asia? Isn't it interesting that the first church mentioned is Ephesus? Isn't it also interesting that when Paul came to Ephesus, he found 12 men? Isn't it interesting that the woman is clothed with, uh, uh, she's clothed with the sun and the moon is under her feet, and there's a crown of 12 stars? All scripture is interconnected and interrelated. And if we'll pay attention to these things and use them sort of as signposts and just allow the Spirit to begin connecting the dots, dots it paints this overall huge picture uh, and opens our eyes to something that is far beyond what, uh, what most of Christian tradition will allow. So, um, so again... <laughs> At the end of Apostle Paul's life, he writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.15 that all they who are in Asia, that would include these seven churches in the book of Revelation, all they who are in Asia have forsaken me. So the woman, the first sign in the Revelation is, um, is the woman, it's the, it's the seven churches and how the seven churches began. And in today's day and age, we could look at it as this is in general the way the church began. It really is because so much of what is in the Revelation is going to tie and dovetail right into everything that's happening right, right now today. And as we go on in this, we're going to see the reality of it and how this is all connected not only to how the church began, but what is presently happening in the here and now and, and what is coming forth out of the church and what it is going to, in a sense, um, begin demonstrating this. We'll get into this, but just in a general form, I don't want to get in real specifics here, but it's just in a general form, the woman is how the church began. And secondly, we have this sign uh, in verse uh, 3. It says, There appeared another wonder or sign in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon. This is what I want to talk about today. Uh, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns, upon his heads, and it says, And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, uh, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Now, I want to kind of just stop right here, and I want to pay uh, particular attention uh, to the description of this dragon. Those of you who are on our e uh, Today's Voice email list, uh, we've been talking recently about how the presence of Moses' law will always portray our Heavenly Father as a great fiery dragon or Pharaoh. A dragon is the symbol for Pharaoh. And our perception of our Father is huge because the image that we have of our Father in our hearts or minds is going to directly impact us and how we treat one another as brethren as well as the world around us. If I perceive the Father as a great fiery dragon or Pharaoh in heaven, then I am going to live in fear and in a sense walk, walk around inwardly on eggshells, always wondering if I'm pleasing God, uh, even you know if when I do get it right, is it enough? Am I doing enough? Um, in the book of the Revelation talks about how these kinds of people who perceive uh, the Heavenly Father as a great fiery dragon or Pharaoh, it talks about how they have no rest day nor night. Because uh, 
as good as it sounds, lost my screen here, as good as it sounds, you know, th they live to please the Lord. Um, you know, this sounds kind of like the opposite, but when you're living to please the Lord, you're really not focusing on the Lord as much as you're focusing on yourself. You remember Mary and Martha, okay? <laughs> Uh, Mary and Martha represent two different kinds of souls. You could also say that Mary and Martha represent two different kinds of churches. You know, Martha, interestingly enough, Martha, uh, her name means tutor or schoolmaster. Uh, and it, it ties right into what Paul wrote to the Galatians, that the law to the Jew, the law, Moses' law to the Jew, was a schoolmaster or tutor uh, to lead them unto Christ. And so, in the presence of Jesus, in the presence of Christ, what's interesting is that Martha uh, is caught up in all of this effort in trying to impress and to please and to serve. And, and then you have Mary. Her name, of course, means uh, bitter or bitterness. And, I mean, if you had to live in the presence of your sister who was... I guess you could say she wants to come off like she wants to be pleasing to everyone and she makes it her aim and her goal to please everyone and keep everyone happy. But really what she's after is the attention. She's after self-promotion. And what uh, Martha doesn't realize is that what she is doing in the presence of Jesus is actually competing with Jesus' presence for Mary's attention. And so uh, you have the two different types of church. Martha would represent the church who is still under the law, in the presence of Christ, yes, but still under the, the mentality of the law. And then you have Mary, Mary, who recognizes who he is, that there is nothing she could possibly do for him, that he did not come to be ministered unto, but to minister and to serve and give his life for a ransom. And... You know, in the middle of all of this, you have Martha, Lord, do you not care? That's almost like the attitude of the older prodigal son. You know, all these years, Father, I have slaved for you. And I like what the New Living Translation says. And not once have I ever refused to do a single thing you spoke to me to do. And yet, after all this time, you have not so much as given me a single kid of the goats. A kid of goat, the goats is a sin offering which indicates that the older prodigal was under the same spirit and mentality of the law, and we know that's true, because the majority of his time is spent hanging out with the household servants. And the servant, by definition, in the scripture, is a servant or slave who is under the mentality of the law. They're, uh, they're rewarded, they are paid based on works and performance, and when you take that son and you stick him around servants and slaves, that mentality, that spirit of mind, that attitude of heart rubs off. And so, you know, going back to Martha and Mary, Martha's attitude, she, she begins accusing the Lord. You know, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Uh, the same way the older prodigal began accusing the father. All these years I've slaved for you. You've never, you've never once given me so much as a kid so that uh, I can make merry with my friends. But as soon as this year's son has come home, who's devoured your living and your, uh, the, our inheritance on prostitutes, you kill for him the fatted calf. Isn't that kind of strange? <laughs> so... Jesus says to Martha, how's this for a positive faith confession? How's this for sweet little Jesus only ever says nice things? He turns to Martha and says, Martha, and I'll, I'll paraphrase it in the original language, you are deeply disturbed and troubled about a great many things, but one thing is needful or necessary, and your sister Mary has chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. And so, <clears throat> You know, the same thing can go back to, even to the Garden of Eden. You know, Adam, you know, when, when the Lord calls Adam on the carpet about what he did as far as partaking of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, just like Martha accused Jesus, just like um, the older prodigal accused his father, Adam, 
says that he sticks his finger basically in God's face and says, the woman that you gave to be with me, she gave me of the, the, the fruit of the tree and I did eat. So, you know, God, you're the problem, and so is this woman that you gave me. Isn't it interesting how that spirit keeps rearing its ugly head? And in all those cases, in all those cases, it wasn't that God was a great fiery dragon. It was that Adam partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is a type of Moses' law, the Lord comes in the garden just to love on Adam and talk with him and fellowship with him like he always did. All of a sudden, Adam's perception, because of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, has now changed. It has changed from that of a father-son relationship to a master or pharaoh and slave relationship. And so, because he partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he wasn't conscious so much and focused on God's presence and the love that God had for him, he's now focused on self. He's now focused on performance. And he knows he's done something wrong based on that tree. So all of a sudden, God is a Pharaoh come to punish him for partaking of that tree. God is come as a Pharaoh come to punish him. The same thing could be said about uh, Martha and Jesus. You know, she didn't think that Jesus, she perceived Jesus as a taskmaster. Uh, she perceived Jesus as a, uh, as a harsh house guest. She perceived him as a pharaoh, and she expected him to reward her based on her serving. The same thing can be said of the older prodigal. The older prodigal perceived the father as a great fiery dragon pharaoh. It, it's, it's really interesting because at that point in the parable, in the parable of the two prodigal sons, the younger prodigal had already come home. And um, he got a different perception of the father. Whereas the older prodigal is still in the outer court, really hanging out near the lake of fire because he doesn't want to take a dip. You got to take a dip in the lake of fire. You have to understand what the lake of fire is for, people. Don't buy into this American gospel and all this nonsense out there that says, you know, God is going to throw you into the lake of fire and burn you forever and have great pleasure in it because, you know, you didn't pray that sinner's prayer or you didn't repent enough or you didn't believe and confess enough. I mean, if you don't repent of your sins and is, quote, Jesus to come into your heart, then God's going to fry your butt in that lake forever and ever and ever. And we don't even realize that the lake of fire... Moses' tabernacle was called the brazen laver. The lake of fire in Solomon's temple was called the brazen sea. It wasn't a place of eternal torment, punishment, and damnation. It was where the priests went, for God's sakes. And they would take off their secular clothes that they wore around their house and in public, in their normal everyday life. They would take those clothes off and wash themselves and put on their priestly garments to go into the tabernacle and perform the service of the tabernacle. And there were 24 courses of priesthood. They went in hourly. They were in hourly shifts. You know, it's 24 elders round about the throne. Interestingly enough, in the book of the Revelation, uh, they're all sitting down simultaneously in the most holy place. That is taboo. Because in the Old Testament, only one dude, the high priest, could go in there once a year. Once a year, and not without blood. How is it that the whole priesthood is now in there, and they're not serving, they're sitting? Something has changed. Wow. But that's alright. <clears throat> Don't worry about it. I'm just a crazy heretic from Reading who doesn't know what he's talking about. So, <laughs> so anyway... Back to this dragon issue. Whenever there is the presence of the or, or spirit of Moses' law, say it that way, the father will always be perceived as a pharaoh. You know, at Mount Sinai, that's exactly what Israel did. God wanted the nation to come up to the mount so that he could reveal himself to them face to face, reveal himself to them face to face as the God of their fathers. He wanted Israel to know him as a father. But when Israel saw, you know, the fire 
and the cherubim and the wings and this voice that spoke out of the fire, oh my gosh, it's a pharaoh. <laughs> but it wasn't the pharaoh. And, uh, oh, I lost my screen again. Be patient with me. Hey, I'm back. Um, but instead of going up into the fire and allowing that supernatural fire to burn out of them that slave mentality garment that they had walked around in for 400 years, they decided to appoint God as their new Pharaoh and Moses as their new taskmaster. Israel in the Old Testament settled for a hearer's covenant. And it, the Old Testament is a hearer's covenant. All throughout the Old Testament, you're gonna hear this over and over again about if you will diligently hearken under the voice of the Lord your God and do that which is right in his sight, then all these blessings shall overtake you. But if you do not hearken here to the voice of the Lord your God and you don't do what is pleasing in his sight, then all these curses shall overtake you. Well, here's some news, folks. Number one, God never intended for them to have that law. They requested it. They were divinely invited to go up and to experience God for themselves in a direct encounter. They chose and settled for an indirect counter, encounter while appointing God as their new Pharaoh, Moses as their new taskmaster. So you have people that I say, well, you know, God will only give you what it is his will to give you. Really? So when, the, when God at Mount Sinai wanted to show them what the father-son relationship was, only one dude in the whole nation had the guts to go up into the fire, and the rest chose a law he never wanted to give him. But you know what God said to Moses? Listen to them. Give them what they want. Hey, it was never God's will to have a, a, a man reign over them as a king. God had always intended to be their king. But guess what happened when Israel wanted a king? God gave them what they wanted. Oh, if we would just some point along the way actually read our Bibles. Very interesting book. <laughs> Very interesting book. So uh, back to this dragon. I want to just, in the time we have left, because I, I guess I did take a couple rabbit trails. So uh, yeah, I'm trying to condense these and behave, but it's hard. I'm, I just, I can't behave too well. Um, <laughs> I want you to see this. The second sign, we spoke about this last time, appeared another wonder in heaven, behold, a great red dragon. Notice he has seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And something else interesting you might find is that this dragon has no eyes. Seven heads, ten horns, seven crowns upon his seven heads, and no eyes. No revelatory capacity. No ability to see into the realm of the spirit. Now let's contrast this, just so you know I am not smoking crack. Contrast this with the lamb. And let's look at the lamb over here in Revelation chapter 5, just briefly. And it says in Revelation 5 verse 6, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth, I love this, into all the earth. The lamb has seven eyes. Does Jesus have seven eyes? No. These are spiritual things, guys. He doesn't have literally seven eyeballs. Just like when he said, if your right hand offends you, hack it off. He didn't mean amputate your hand or, or get into self-mutilation. See, we don't have any problem thinking, oh, well, when Jesus is talking about plucking out your eyeball if it offends you, or cutting off your hand if it offends you, or cutting off your foot. We have no problem saying, oh, well, Jesus was just speaking symbolically. But yet somehow, when we come to the book of the Revelation, it's like, oh, this is literal. This is a literal mark of 666 that the big bad, the big bad is going to stamp on your forehead and in your hand. So get ready. It's coming. Really? 
Just like Jesus has seven eyeballs and seven horns coming out of his head. Can't pick and choose, guys. It's either all, his words are all spirit and life, or they are not. And to say that, well, some of what Jesus says is spiritual, and some of it is earthly. Oh, well, there's a name for that. It's called Babylon. It's called mixture. It's called confusion. And the church in general, and I know because I used to be a part of it, is one of the most mixed up, confused bunches of people on the face of the earth. And I love every one of them. <laughs> I am not hateful. I am not spiteful. I just know what's out there, and I know why it's there. It's the perception of the Father. Seven heads, ten horns. Seven crowns upon his seven heads, no eyes. No eyes. And I'm going to tell you something. If we perceive the Father as this great fiery dragon, if we allow the spirit of Moses' law to pervert and alter the image of the Father. See, Abba Father is not a great fiery dragon. He's not a heavenly Pharaoh. He's a lamb. He's a lamb, and he's not mad at you, and he loves you unconditionally in every sense of the word. And he is patiently waiting for us to continue to discover this great love. I mean, how does this relate to the book of Revelation? Oh, the whole book of Revelation, guys, gals, boys, girls, ladies, gentlemen, children of all ages. The whole book of the Revelation is a revelation of the Father's love. And a detailed account of the manifestation of the fullness of God's sons who come into the light of that knowledge. It's not an end of the world epic horror story. It's glorious. And that's why it's really on our heart to get into this more. Now, one thing here before we close. Oh, you say, well, what's the seven heads and the ten horns? Well, for right now and in general, what we're going to say, seven is the biblical number for perfection. Um, it also is the number for rest, you know, the seventh day, Sabbath day. But in its simplest form, seven is the number of perfection and ten is the number of the law, ten commandments. So the seven heads and the ten horns is the mentality, the seven heads, the mentality of perfection under the law. Seven heads, ten horns. It's the mentality, the mentality of perfection under a law, under the law. Perfection through performance. Here's one for you. Perfection through obedience. And notice the crowns are on the seven heads. Doesn't the now the, the, the crowns show the emphasis? We're going to find on the beast, the beast is the spirit that. It's a spirit of mind and an attitude of heart that rises within us if we perceive the father as a great fiery dragon. Just like the older prodigal perceived his father as a great fiery dragon, there was a spirit of mind and attitude of heart that rose within him. And it will in us if we allow any part. Paul said a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Any part of Moses' law comes in, it distorts the image of the Father. We see him as a great fiery dragon or pharaoh in heaven. All of a sudden, that gives power to a quote-unquote beast. It describes a spirit of mind or attitude of heart that rises within us. Interestingly enough, we'll get into this next time, that beast also has seven heads and ten horns. Because it is the spirit of mind or attitude of heart that views perfection based on law. The only difference is that with the beast, the ten crowns are on the ten horns. With the dragon, the seven crowns are on the seven heads because the crowns show the emphasis. Doesn't the church at large view our Heavenly Father as a God who demands and expects perfection? Sort of like a lot of our earthly fathers did. Perform for love. Obey for love. 
can't. The Father's love is a gift that's freely given. You just have to receive it, that's all. Accept it. So what does that beast, that antichrist spirit of mind or attitude of heart, begin to focus on, major and emphasize, if it perceives the Father as a dragon pharaoh who demands perfection? Oh, well, the antichrist spirit of mind or attitude of heart, the beast, he is going to reach for the ten horns and emphasize the ten horns and try through the ten horns, the application of the ten commandments, to achieve perfection in the eyes of his father so that he can earn the love and inheritance that the father, or at least he perceives the father, is making available. Didn't the older prodigal do the same? You see how all this is interconnected? Crowns. We can go into this in so many different directions, so many different angles. You, if it's a kingdom, if a king has a crown, if you're next in line for the crown, if you're the king's son, you can't earn the crown. You can't work for it. It's given to you through inheritance. And see, this is what Paul meant. We're going to show you, I'm going to show you guys in detail. This is so mind-boggling. I, I still keep, the flood of revelation that keeps coming from this is just mind-boggling. I'll be speaking about this for a thousand lifetimes. Um, that's why Paul wrote to the Galatians that um, if the inheritance is based on the law, if the crown is based on performance and obedience, then it's no longer uh, based on promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. Not performance, not obedience. The younger prodigal could never earn or work in a thousand lifetimes for what his father freely gave him when he decided to come home. It was already his. Well, we're over the half hour mark and I got to go for now. I could talk about this forever, but uh, we're going to get into this more uh, without the rabbit trails next time. Sorry about that, but um, but just remember the dragon, seven heads and ten horns, will beget within us. And you know what the dragon is because I've repeated myself enough. The dragon has seven heads and ten horns and it will, in a sense, a spiritual symbolic sense, beget or father an antichrist spirit of mind or attitude of heart or beast within us that also has seven heads and ten horns. The whole thing is perfection under law. The, the, the beast perceives that the dragon father demands perfection, which is why the older prodigal wanted the younger prodigal punished. And so therefore the beast reaches for religious law, the dead letter of Moses' law, because he thinks that it's through those ten he'll inherit the crown. That's why the crown are on the ten horns when it comes to the beast. But in regard to the dragon father, he's perceived as a father who demands perfection for love and inheritance. And our father is just not like that. So I'm going to share with you guys a little bit more about this. Uh, also, feel free to check out our website, www.todaysvoice.org. You can sign up to be on our Today's Voice email list. Uh, also, this coming Sunday, uh, what is it? The 3rd, 10th, 17th. Uh, yeah, September 17th, Sunday, 2025 Noble Street, West Lawn, PA. We are going to be actually delving into the fourth thunder in the book of the Revelation. We're going to start talking about the fourth church which is the church of Thyatira. And in the fourth thunder, we see there is a transition that begins taking place. Uh, the bride begins to emerge and come forth and begins to start touching the world with the knowledge of the manifest glory of God. It's going to be good. You should be there. And also, uh, I think it's September 23rd. Uh, we'll be back in Ashburn, Virginia for another home fellowship group in the home of our uh, dear sister and friend, Jackie Lonto. Uh, look forward to that. Info is on the website. Hope you can make one of these meetings. 10 a.m. meetings are at 10 a.m. Or excuse me, 
Sunday meetings are at 10 a.m. I'm getting all beside myself, which sometimes is fun. The Sunday mornings are at 10 a.m. <laughs> and uh, the uh, Saturday fellowship groups in Virginia, uh, which are once a month, are at 2 p.m. in the afternoon. So it might be an off time. Some of you might be able to make that. So we look forward to seeing you guys next time. We're going to delve a little bit more into this relationship between the dragon and the beast. And uh, you're going to have a good time. Love you guys. And uh, have a good one. Talk to you later.